I'd like to welcome you this evening to the kickoff of our spring lecture series, Oceans Alive. I'm delighted you've all come this evening, and we have two more events coming up after tonight. Next week, um, the event moves to 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and that is to welcome the winners, top winners of the Falmouth High School and Falmouth Academy Science Fair projects. You'll meet four very bright, exciting students in preparation for their trip to the state science fair and so that will be next Tuesday at 4 p.m. and the last um, lecture in the series will be again at 7 o'clock on May 10th and it will be journalist Trevor Corson uh, talking about his book The Secret Life of Lobsters. Uh, we just discovered today that Trevor's girlfriend was a graduate student in the MIT Woods Hole Joint Program, and we didn't know that connection he had to Woods Hole when we invited him to give the talk. So um, he's been in this auditorium as a, an audience member, but not as a speaker, so the tables will turn. But we'd also like you to look on your way out at our new product, the Beachcombers Companion. This is a project with the artwork done by Tessa Morgan. Um, some of the design done by Michael Despizio and a lot of the text and a final design and organization by Tracy Crago. And they're kind of a fun product to take to the beach. And so they, they're selling like hotcakes and uh, you should really take a look um, at the cards. Uh, the squid are in here somewhere, but I won't flip through them. But they're a waterproof paper and it's actually the newest use of this paper called UPO. The manufacturer is so excited about how the cards came out that they want to use this now as a prototype in, in looking at other kind of waterproof materials. So we're very proud of it. Um, Tracy did a wonderful job pulling this together along with Sherry's help and Tessa's help and Michael's help and so please look at them on your way out. Uh, tonight uh, very happy to introduce Roger Hanlon who as been working on squid for as long as I've known Roger, and um, some of which with, with funding from Huey C. Grant since he came to Woods Hole. Uh, Roger started working in, in squid not in these waters, um, but in Galveston uh, in the biomedical research facility at the University of Texas. Uh, but since he's come to Woods Hole, his interest in squid has just gone in many different directions. And this <coughs> evening he'll be giving an overview of some of his work. And the title of his talk is The Id of the Squid, Examining the Behavioral Ecology of Squid. Roger? Good. Uh, thank you, Judy. And it's uh, a real pleasure to be here. Thanks, everyone, for taking the time to come out uh, and learn something about the squid. So uh, I've been studying these animals, as Judy said, uh, for quite a long time. Uh, the work I'm going to talk about tonight is rather focused. I'm not going to cover all of the behavioral ecology of squid. And furthermore, I'm going to concentrate not so much on the local squid, but on the California uh, squid, Loligo. And the reason for that is that uh, the pro program that Ken Foote and I uh, were funded on to, to look at the acoustic portion of the work I'll present uh, required us to make a decision between the East Coast and the West Coast, and since it involves squid eggs, we decided uh, the scientific judicious thing to do is to go where we know uh, the eggs are, and that was on the West Coast. So uh, I'll be happy to entertain questions about the local squid. If anyone has any, uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today uh, is germane to the local situation as well. So first, uh, lots of thanks. This is a, a, a large collaboration that we're engaged in. Uh, Sir Ken Foote uh, tonight uh, has really helped uh, with a huge amount of the work I'm going to present to you tonight. He's here in Huey, of course. Uh, sea Grant, uh, Judy uh, mentioned some of the funding from the local Sea Grant and also from the National Office. We're very grateful for that. We have two close collaborators at Cal State University Monterey Bay in California. That's Rick Kavitek, Patty and Petro. John Forsyth and funding from NERP helped me lay the groundwork for much of what you'll see in the first part of the uh, talk tonight. Uh, Sarah Fangman, NOAA Marine Sanctuary in Santa Barbara, made vessels uh, uh, available to us for part of our work. Uh, Dan Vasey, Santa Barbara City College, Brett Hobson, Dirk Rosen, all experts with ROVs, remotely operated vehicles, supported our work in California. Monterey Peninsula College in Monterey, California also provided equipment. 
Uh, we uh, ran uh, through an ROV, had a lot of problems. Sylvia Earle came to the rescue and loaned us her ROV during a critical moment, so we thank her. We had great crew members on the RV John Martin, part of the Moss Landing Marine Lab. Uh, the RV Mako is the California Department of Fish and Game, their main research vessel. Lady J is a squid fisherman, a uh, squid boat owned by Tommy Noto, whom we've worked with, and many collaborations with California Department of Fish and Game. So uh, we span universities and federal governments and state governments uh, and private industry in this particular collaboration that I'll uh, present tonight. So, okay, here it is, the id of the squid. Now, make sure that everyone understands that there is a book called The Id of the Squid, and it's even in the Huey MBL Library. Uh, it's a spoof, uh, but it does start off talking about squid. So I wanted to start out tonight with the real definition of id. This is straight out of the dictionary. So the part of the psyche residing in the unconscious that is the source of instinctive impulses that seek satisfaction in accordance with the pleasure principle. Well, this is a very Freudian sort of approach to behavior. Uh, so there's the id, and what is a squid? Well, I think you all know roughly what a squid is, but what I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit today is what the squid does all day long. What is it about the life and the behavior of a squid? And <clears throat> the aphorism that uh, many of my colleagues use, I didn't develop this, but I use it, is live fast and die young, because indeed these animals live less than a year. They have extraordinarily fast growth. And so the life cycle is turning over very rapidly indeed. But the daily mantra of a squid is, like many animals, eat, don't get eaten, and reproduce. And join up with your buddies in school, or <coughs> shoal is the proper term for that is. So this is a very unusual organism in many ways. Uh, but I want to share with you, uh, right out of the book, uh, some uh, witty person in Woods Hole, still anonymous right here, the id of the squid. So I'll let you read that. I'm not going to... Uh, interfere with this one. Okay, so obviously uh, this interesting character had a little much to drink one night in Woods Hole and decided uh, what is it about squids, but there are some, some truths in here, <laughs> it turns out. And so I'm going to try and point some of these out uh, and talk a little bit uh, about the behavioral ecology of these animals. But first, we need a definition of squid, and the definition is bait. Yes, my colleagues like uh, Dale have accused me of studying bait for 30 years, and yes, I definitely have been studying bait for 30 years. There's absolute truth to that. But here's what my definition is of an octopus or a squid. And uh, again, a yummy hunk of protein that every predator in the ocean is chasing. Absolutely. It's the reason that it's good bait, that's for sure. But the fact that it does taste good and is being chased forms its life cycle and its behavior in many ways, which I'll point out in a moment. But in terms of tasting good, here's a picture I took a few years ago of <coughs> a local fish who seemed awful fat. And when I cut it open and looked inside, there were two whole squids inside that fish right there. Quite an incredible bit of predation, I'm sure you'll agree. Uh, so there are a lot of predators out there, many of the ground fishes and the pelagic fishes are feeding on squid as one of their primary food sources. And the idea that even when the squids descend near the bottom to mate and lay eggs, they're at great risk of predation from some of the flat fishes that are on the bottom. And it's hard to believe that that mouth could open wide enough to ingest a whole squid, but it certainly did. Those animals weren't even torn up very much. The more serious side, uh, a squid is a mollusk related to oysters and clams and heavily shelled animals. It has eight arms and two tentacles. Not ten tentacles, and not eight tentacles or anything like that. It's actually, uh, there are ten appendages on there. The two long tentacles shoot out at a distance to grab prey, and the short arms uh, are for handling the prey closer by. And if the squid happens to be large, we would say that this is a diver's nightmare. And I say that because this is one of the ultimate predators. When you watch a squid feed on something, the two long tentacles go out, they bring it in, they wrap it up. And once they have it wrapped up, they have a beaked mouth where they just start chomping away one big bite at a time. So uh, do they get big? I brought a picture tonight that was taken right next to me by Brian Scarry, a photographer I worked with. 
Um, and that squid right there is as big as me. Uh, not quite, it's about 150 pounds and I'm closer to 180. But this is a diver's nightmare. This squid is in, is called the Humboldt squid, the Cetagus gigas. And it was, uh, this was photographed, we were studying the animal in Baja, California, and we were diving to see if we could get some images of the behavior of this animal. And I'll tell you, I've been diving a long time and made a lot of dives, and I've never been so humbled or scared to death in my life as when this thing came near us. So you're absolutely <laughs> helpless <laughs> when an animal that big, a predator like that, comes nearby. So yes, squids do get big. Uh, I'm going to talk about little squids today. In fact, the, the California squid and the local squid is really, you know, only about this long at the most. Um, if anyone has questions later on about the giant squid, which is Archituthis, I'll be happy to answer those later, but I'm not going to address it now. Okay, what are some of the oddities of squid you might want to realize before we get into the story? Is first of all, very short-lived. And this animal has, this animal group, they have an enormous brain, 34 distinct lobes of the brain, uh, giant optic lobes. These animals are capable of complex behavior. They have short and long-term memory. Their cousins, the oysters, don't have this, believe me. It's very different development for a, for a mollusk. They have this incredibly delicate skin that produces patterning, not only for signaling other uh, mates and against predators, but also for camouflage. Um, that sentence right there really represents about half of my research life, but I won't talk about that tonight. They have wonderful sense organs, in particular the eyes. They have very large human-like eyes. These are complex eyes, but there's some real oddities. Although they can see very well, high visual acuity, they can see at night, image-forming eye. They <coughs> can see polarized light. PS stands for polarization sensitivity. It means they can see the aspect of light that gets plain polarized. And I won't talk about it anymore tonight, except to mention that polarization vision enables a squid to see transparent prey better. In other words, it breaks camouflage of transparency, which is very common in the ocean. And they see the transparent prey, and they feed selectively on small transparent organisms. So it's a very cool trick in the world of predator and prey uh, that has given them a benefit in predation. But curiously enough, these animals can't see color vision. And uh, they have beautiful color matched camouflage, the octopus, the cuttlefish, and the squid, uh, but they uh, do not have color vision. We just finished some experiments on that. So they have some unusual capabilities. It's a very, very visual animal is one of the ideas I want to leave you with. And highly predatory, I already mentioned that, uh, squids in the smaller stages eat, uh, in the very young stages, will eat their body weight per day, and even the adults are eating 20% of their body weight per day. Imagine if you ingested food at that rate. Uh, of course, this leads to very high growth rates because their conversion efficiency of shrimp into squid tissue uh, on, a, on a wet weight basis is very high. Uh, so they are very efficient eaters, and they eat a lot. But they have jet propulsion, they have these tentacles, they have the whole lifestyle and body form for a high speed, moving, swimming, fast predator. And <coughs> curiously enough, there are a lot of great oddities about the animal. I mean, cephalopod means head foot. What kind of goofy animal has its head on its feet? Or its feet on its head, however you want to say it. Uh, and it is a very unusual body form. Uh, but physiologically, they're just as odd. <laughs> they, they have these crazy arrangements. Uh, the animals really have almost no energy stores uh, because they don't store energy as fat like many animals do, which is a very efficient way. They have a little bit of tissue that's held uh, as protein, but that's an inefficient, bioenergetically inefficient way to store food. They have to eat daily because they can't store much food. So that day in the life of Ivan Skudovich means that every day they have to ingest something because they're swimming all moments. They're never resting. So they're swimming pretty much 24 hours a day. Uh, and since they can't store energy, they have to eat all the time. So this is definitely an animal that has to stay on the move. Uh, it is a protein machine. That makes it a good bait, of course. But the best meal for a squid is a full protein meal. Squids are made up almost exclusively of protein. So therefore, what is the best meal for a squid? Another squid makes a pretty good meal for another squid. And in fact, Ron O'Dor surmises that when squids migrate, they fuel their migration by eating the weaker squids in the school. It's a very interesting uh, 
way to look at the energetic cycle. Now, who cares about squid and who uses them? Uh, in nature, at least, squids play a very central role in, in, in marine ecosystems. They are sort of in the middle there. Many of the bigger predators eat squid. They, in turn, are highly predaceous, and they eat small fishes, and they eat a wide range of invertebrates. So if you look at uh, food chains, you tend to find squids right up there in one of those pivotal uh, positions. And there are a lot of squids in the ocean. Sperm whales feed exclusively on squids. That means there are a heck of a lot of squids out there. Squids, in turn, eat a lot as well. Here's a little diagram, not very readable back from there. I'm not trying to give you an eye exam. Uh, but if you look at this, squid are right in the middle. This was done in Monterey Bay, California. And uh, the point of the diagram is that in that small ecosystem in front of the kelp beds right near shore, uh, squids are the primary prey item of 19 species of fishes and nine species of birds, diving birds, two marine mammals. So uh, there are a lot of very important animals feeding exclusively on squid. So they're right in the middle, as I said. Now, to humans, again, uh, they are important as bait. That's not a big money industry, but it is an industry because recreational fishing is very important to local economies. Uh, to calamari, which is to say a fancy word for squid that they use in restaurants, so you don't think you're eating a yucky squid, you're eating calamari. Uh, and locally, the, the local squid fishery is worth, local being the Northeast United States, is about a $30 million a year fishery. In California, uh, the fishery in California alone is somewhere in the vicinity of 30 to $35 million. And that is the most valuable marine fishery in California. So you should immediately ask, what happened to tuna and salmon and abalone and all these other things? Well, there's a lot of fishing going on in the world, and there is fishing down the food chain. So when you get to the point where calamari are one of your most productive fisheries, there's probably something wrong uh, out there in how we harvest the ocean. Uh, a uh, couple of folks in the audience here will appreciate that I put this little bullet in. Uh, at the MBL, squids are a big item uh, for biomedical research organisms. Uh, they're used in neuroscience. They have the, the largest single nerve fiber on the planet. And so there are teams of investigators who come to the MBL every year, and they use the squids as a model of a single nerve cell. And this is one of the best studied, if not the best studied nerve cell on Earth. There have been Nobel Prizes won. Uh, an Alaska Award, which is the American Nobel Prize, was won just three years ago at the NBL for work on squid axons, they call them, the nerve fibers. So uh, this is really uh, quite important to the biomedical research world, especially neuroscience. Uh, but I also point out, getting back to the bait thing, is that squids are also important for recovering fish stocks because here in the Northeast, a lot of our ground fishes and other pelagic fishes, as those stocks are allowed to recover, uh, they have to have food to eat to recover. If you start harvesting too many squids, then you can really impact the food available to other fish stocks. So this is a way to transition in and talk to you uh, now about uh, a very Sea Grant kind of issue, which is not just the biology of loligo or squid, but the biology of the squid in relation to the fishery, because the, there is an impact of fishery. And I want to talk a little bit about how one would go about managing a fishery in a sustainable manner, and what kind of tools are needed, and what kind of information are needed biologically so that one can understand the squid and manage it properly. And this is a big disconnect uh, in many aspects of fishery management uh, in the USA and elsewhere. One of, the, one of the roles that we can play here, we who are funded by Sea Grants, and one of the missions of Sea Grant is to provide basic information so managers and others can better um, understand the fishery and the dynamic movements of the animals. So <clears throat> let's go to California for a minute, and um, maybe a few minutes we're going to stay here. And I want to show you the map here. Uh, this is Los Angeles down here. This is the land. This is the ocean. Here's Los Angeles. There's San Francisco. There's Monterey. Now, this uh, diagram happens to show where the fishery occurs. And <clears throat> this is Southern California, and these are the Channel Islands right here. And this is the bulk of the fishery. About uh, three-fifths, four-fifths of the total landings take place in this very large area that's more or less adjacent to shore, but includes uh, the uh, Channel Islands 
some of which uh, are protected. And then Monterey Bay, which is right there, is where we have focused our study. That fishery is over 140 years old. It's now developed wildly in terms of scope and size. Uh, and this is part of the northern fishery right here. This is the southern fishery. It's hard to see the blocks, but most of the catch takes place here and directly in Monterey Bay. And when I say directly, this has impact because, as you're going to see in a minute, most of the fishery is taking place right in, on, or adjacent to the spawning areas. And that begs an important question. So there's the red dot. That's the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Maybe some of you have been to Monterey, have been to the aquarium. Uh, if you stand at the aquarium and you look out on the ocean, there's some kelp beds there. And just a stone's throw on the other side of the kelp beds is where the squids are spawning. That's one of the major spawning grounds right out in here. So what this diagram shows is our study area. And the reason it's a good study area is that uh, the fishing fleet concentrates its effort in a very small area. It's rather protected water, so if you're doing field work or fishing, you have a lot of good fishing days or work days. Uh, it's immediately adjacent to shore. And what I've drawn here are um, these little rectangles or whatever geometric form that happens to be. Uh, those happen to be the areas in which we went back and got the catch records for the squid fishery and all the year's catches were occurring right in a segment right there and a segment there over an entire year. So the squid fishery is based right there and the question we pose now is what's so special about this area? This is a tiny area. Uh, Monterey Bay has a very big body of water and all the fishing is taking place right there. It turns out that we know this is a spawning ground, but no one knew the extent of the eggs or how much spawning was actually occurring there. Here's a photograph right here, uh, now two years old, in which we photograph simultaneously 25 purse saners in an area less than a mile in diameter. Here's our, uh, this is about 1.5 miles right there. Here are all the boats right here. So in this tiny area, there are 25 purse saners working right next to each other. And these aren't small purse saners, these are pretty good sized boats. And uh, you know, one of these purse sanes could encircle uh, several of, these, of this building right here, for example. So they're concentrating in a very tight area, and when there are that many purse sanes out at once, I mean, they literally have one purse sane up against the other sometimes, one boat against the other. Obviously, they have the capability to take an awful lot of squids out <laughs> in one area. Our question is, what's underneath that area? And it turns out that there are a lot of egg beds right there. So <clears throat> we talk to the fishermen, we talk to the managers, and we say, well, you know, maybe we have to be a little careful here. And one of the reasons is this. This is the list of unknowns about the squid fishery. Now, if your job was to manage the squid fishery and you didn't know the standing stock size, the maximum sustainable yield, you didn't know all the locations of the spawning grounds or even the primary ones, and you didn't know whether the squids come back to the same place, how many genetic stocks there are, uh, you would be hard pressed to put together <laughs> a fishery management plan that would lead to uh, a sustainable fishery. And this is the problem that the fishery managers have in many cases, certainly they have it in California. Might be a little worse there because, believe it or not, since the fishery was formalized, there has never been a squid management plan for the California squid, which is beyond my comprehension. Uh, one was implemented uh, f four months ago, <laughs> finally. Uh, so at least there is now a squid management plan. There's been squid management plans elsewhere, including here, for a long time. So here is the gist of our funded study right now. If you know the, the animals are spawning in a certain area, does it make sense to allow direct fishing on those spawning squids? Now, they only live one year, and they're only spawning during one period, so it's pretty obvious that annual recruitment is necessary to sustain the fishery. I know it's not that simple, but in general, uh, there is a major uh, bit of egg laying going on between April, April to June, and then a minor bit of egg laying uh, in the fall. So this is the question uh, that we're posing. Now, I learned, what I'm going to show you here, I learned from the fishermen, from Tom Noto and the Lady Jane. 
we went out <coughs> um, and we obtained records here of the catches beginning in April of 2000 and we did this uh, over, I don't know, 140 days, several months time. And California Department of Fish and Game gave us these catch landings, which are reasonably accurate. But I want you to pay attention to the idea that there aren't squids here all the time. The landings go in peaks and they come in pulses or waves. The first thing the fishermen told us was the squid aren't here all the time, so we go out on our boat and we acoustically, with our phantometer, <coughs> see when the squids are around and then we fish them. And fish them they do. They fish them very hard and then the catches invariably go down. So they fish them very, very hard with 25 purse seiners in a small area and often, usually, there aren't that many squids left and they stop fishing. Then they hang around and they wait till the next pulse of squids come. So here's the question. If these squids are coming in and they're coming in right on top of the spawning grounds, does it make sense to fish them right away before they lay eggs for next year's recruitment class? That's the scenario that seems to be unfolding in this tiny area. So uh, we're trying to get a grip on this and see if we can find out what those squids are really doing and, and where they're doing that, okay? So we'd like to really let them spawn before they get harvested. Uh, that would seem like a sensible thing. So data are a dangerous thing. We decided to go get some of those data and rather than sit in the boat and speculate about what the squids are doing 140 feet under, uh, we got some of these slick machines thanks to funding from National Sea Research Program, uh, NASA and others provided the ROVs and we decided to go down and really film and find out what's down there in terms of eggs, what's down there in terms of spawning squids because frankly nobody knows. Well here's what happens. There might be in 140 feet of water the fishermen go out and with their fathometer they can get a strong mark showing that there are maybe one to five million squids in a school that's you know twice the size of this room or maybe a little bigger and they'll be in the middle of the water column somewhere. And what they try to do is get them up to the surface. So sometimes they'll, they'll fish at night and put out bright lights and the squids will be attracted to the lights. And when they do that, it's easy to purse them because you get them all right up on the surface and then you just purse the whole thing and you've got them. At other times during the day, the squids are farther down in the water column uh, and it's a little harder to purse them. The purses generally are 60 feet deep and 140 feet of water so they can fish half the water column and they can fish shallower than that too. But this picture tells something very interesting. When we took the ROV down and drove along the bottom, uh, we expected occasionally to see huge swarms of squid because that's what we learned from the Night of the Squid in 1957 when Jacques Cousteau's famous television program came on and it showed zillions of squids all spawning on the bottom and them all dying off. And this is what is understood and accepted as the, uh, the spawning cycle of the squid. Even the managers in California believe this. They think that the squids have these mass spawning events at night and that they die. So the fishermen go, okay, if they have mass spawning events at night and they all die, we are going to purse them and fish them because tomorrow they're not going to be here, at least in a few days. So the fishery has been based on that general idea for a long time. That's not what we saw. This is what we saw. We saw tiny little groups of squids. There are only about uh, 20 or 40 squids in that little pod, we'll call that a spawning pod, if you will. And we didn't see any other squids around. We, and we kept seeing this repeatedly. In fact, in the, the first week we did this, we saw 80 or 90 of these tiny little groups of squids spread out around the eggs. We never saw one of these big mass spawning events. And another thing that's interesting, and you can't see it on the resolution, but you notice there's white and dark. The squids, the males, have sort of brick red arms. And every one of these is a pair where the male is holding on to the female. Uh, this is what we call ultimate mate guarding. Uh, when the male mates the female, he holds her so that other small males can't come and mate her at the same time and it's a form of guarding the female. As long as he's holding the female, another male can't come up and mate that female. So every one of these are mating pairs and there are no single females on the bottom, but there are a few extra males. So this sets up competition for the females. So what this is, 
is a big courtship and mating uh, arrangement, but the question is, where are the rest of the squids? And it turns out that the squids are way up here. <laughs> and what happens is that when you go to the bottom, the only squids we see are the ones that are actively mating and laying eggs, and that most of the squids are up in the water calm, and they're not mating and laying eggs at all. So the ramifications of this I'll get to uh, in just a minute. Now, this brings us to the subject of sex. And what the animals are doing down here are those things right there. Where is the initial pair formed is one of the questions. And we now know that the pairs are formed way up in the big school. We don't know why or how, but at some point in time, the males and females come together. And when we see the animals with an ROV, when we see them descending to the water, the females are always paired. So they're, they're having the little courtship dance up in the water column, and the males and females pair, and they come down together. But there are also always a couple extra males who are following them, hoping they can beat up one of these guys and get their own girlfriend for that day. And so we do have this competition. So you have mate guarding going on, too, because there are extra males competing for these females. So what is my point? My point is that there's a rather complex behavioral situation going on here. These aren't just dumb animals that somehow get gametes and lay eggs. There is a long series of rituals and intricate behaviors in which pair formation occurs. Now imagine if the pair formation is occurring and either a troll comes right through and breaks the school up or a person gets set. Obviously, you're interfering with some of those natural processes. And we also found that uh, this behavior is not occurring at night. It is occurring in Monterey Bay only during the day. <laughs> and at night, the animals spread out and feed, just the opposite of what uh, we thought was going to happen. So I'm going to switch and just show a little video now um, of, that is if we're lucky. Okay. Now, I'm going to go and show a little bit of the video of what's actually happening. So you've already seen this picture. So here we are. This I took diving at about 100 so feet. And you see the animals are all paired and a couple females laying eggs right in here. Uh, but they're moving a little bit away from me. So here's an egg bed right here, big white eggs. And here's an extra male. There's an extra male. There's an extra male. But the ones with the dark arms are all paired. So here's a male and a female coming closer and getting ready to deposit a single egg finger, which is quite large. Here's a male coming in and trying to pull apart a pair and take, take over one of the females as a mate. So there are a lot of dynamics going on here. Here you go again. There's the female and the male holding her. All these ones with red arms are paired. And you see there's a lot of activity. And these loners back here, these are the troublemakers because they're coming in and they're pulling. We call this the twist and shout. The, a male will come and grab the two and try and twist them apart so that he can then copulate with the female. So here's the twist and shout uh, that our volunteers called. Watch this animal right here. He comes down and tries to grab. And the reply by the male is to twist and shout and break off that sneaker male. So it's been very successful. So holding on, here's another one coming. Just a weak attempt on that pair. It didn't work. Watch again. I forget who's who here. Right there. There's an attempt that was unsuccessful. Another unsuccessful. Let's see what happens. He loses. So it turns out about 95% of the time, that trick doesn't work. So the mate guarding is 95% efficient. Now watch what happens here. Everyone is just going through all the uh, mating and egg laying, and all of a sudden, whoa, let's get out of here. <laughs> and this is one of the things that really occurs. And, and this is the other thing that's very important right here, is that the females uh, actually uh, break off. Oops. Sorry, I just want to make a point right here that this one right here. Uh, the question is, how long do they stay on the bottom, and, and how does the party end? And what happens is that when the female lays a number of eggs, all of a sudden, she will reach down and rip the arms off the male who's holding her, and then she'll bolt straight up like a missile coming off the bottom, and she'll join the school that'll be many meters above. So 
although the video would lead you to believe that the males are pushing the system by grabbing females and holding them almost forcefully it seems it's not forceful at all the female is deciding when they pair allowing herself to be paired and held when she goes down but when she's finished laying eggs or she's tired of the whole business she just rips that guy's arms off and she goes and it's hundred percent successful every time the female does that and we have hundreds of examples it works so the f yeah, fertilization is the question. Uh, what happens uh, is that the male and the female, the male is holding the female, then he reaches and takes a packet of sperm called a spermatophore, and he takes it out and he places it up into her cavity of her body, and he just leaves it there near the gills. So technically, it's not internal fertilization; it's in the body cavity, but you know she's breathing water through that at the same time and then those sperm packets break and they're just swimming, free swimming inside her mantle cavity. And then she pulls out a finger of eggs in her arms and all those free swimming sperm are just around the outside of the jelly egg and the sperm get into the jelly and they start swimming in to fertilize one of the 150 eggs. So it's literally the size of a human finger, all gelatinous with 150 little dots of eggs and the sperm just free swim down in and compete with one another to get to the egg and fertilize it. So there's a lot of scope for what we call sperm competition, which is the females can store sperm for multiple males and they may mate with one or two males while they're on the bottom. So when she pulls that egg finger out, there are multiple sources of sperm swimming and competing to go into the egg. Now there's a consequence to that that I'll show you in a minute, and that is there's a lot of multiple paternity in the egg fingers. In other words, there's a lot of gene mixing in the mating system, which is really quite good and interesting. So thank you for reminding me, I forgot that point. Now, uh, let's move on and see what this all means. Okay, so here was one of the surprises we found, and that is that uh, if we really plot the time of mating and egg laying uh, over uh, many days and weeks of driving an ROV day and night all over the spawning grounds, uh, we plot from midnight to midnight, we plot how many spawning squids we have, uh, it's pretty much eight or nine in the morning till five or six in the evening, which is the day, late, day length period. So very clearly, they are spawning during the day, and we did several all-night things where we would watch these animals disperse off the bottom at night. We drive all over the bottom at night, and we'd never see spawning squids on the bottom. Now, to spawn, you do have to be on the bottom. You have to, they push their eggs into the substrate. So clearly, no egg laying was taking place over three years when we were doing this work. Uh, these data are considered very controversial by the fishermen in California. They just flat don't believe us, and they've been criticizing us heavily about this. Um, they say there's a lot of spawning at night, and so we go, okay, get some film and let's see something. But we haven't gotten any data from them yet. Uh, we're trying to work with them and make them understand that uh, we're on their side, we're not against them. Uh, another surprise came, and that is that we didn't see any mass mortalities. Uh, egg laying, which you just observed, where a female comes down here, she's holding an egg right there, and there's one depositing, is a very slow process. This is not what they call big bang reproduction, where it all happens fast and everyone's engaged. What it is, is individual females are only laying one egg about every nine minutes under normal conditions, and then fishes come through and scare them away, or small sneakers males come through and disrupt them. So uh, it's, it's actually a very slow process of laying these egg beds down. They're built up over days and weeks, not one or a few nights. And we've seen this repeatedly, at least in Monterey Bay and that particular spawning ground. Now, we did see one great big spawning event big to us, but I think small by historical records. Uh, we call it a megapod, which is to say that if you can make up these images, you can, they're not very good resolution, I'm afraid. But this is in an ROV about uh, four to 10 meters off the bottom, looking down the white 
are the big egg masses, and everything in between are squids. So uh, there are thousands of squids actively on the bottom mating and egg laying. This was the biggest spawning aggregation we had seen in three years of work out there. But uh, still small compared to the number of squids that were there just up in the water column. So occasionally there are some big spawning events, but we did not find any dead animals on the bottom, either after this day of spawning or in three years of scouring the bottom in Monterey Bay, we never saw dead squid sitting on the bottom. So maybe there are mass spawning events in Southern California. They don't occur in Northern California. We don't know yet. But OK, here's what it all looks like. Here's what we can tie together right now to explain the system. If you look on a fisherman's fathometer, you're up at the surface, it's 15 fathoms. You pick up these white splotches, OK? Those are squids. In here, this is the main school at A, the sex ratio is one to one, one male for one female. Down at the bottom where these little specks are, down here, the sex ratio is two males for every female. And it's the females who are deciding <laughs> what that ratio is because only a few of them are coming down and only those that are paired. Every animal that we ever saw by an ROV in this middle of the water column, and re remember that's five fathoms or 30 feet, that's a long way up and down, all the animals in here were males, lone males. So they're, they're waiting for the pairs to come, <laughs> come down and intercept them. Or the females that jet up, who finish spawning, they're trying to grab them. So it's a real interesting sort of bar scene here, competition for the males, or for the females rather. So what you get is you might have a school with 20,000 or maybe even half a million squids up in the water column. Uh, down on the bottom, you have small groups of 10 to 100, maybe 300 squids, and they're actively spawning at the egg beds. In between, you get female migration from the bottom back up, but when they come down, they're always paired. And these are always uh, groups of small, lone males. So you've got a complex mating system, egg deposition is slow, and the fishermen have now begun to fish during the day rather than at night. Now before they fished voluntarily, always at night because they figured that was the easiest to get them in close to the lights and they could purse them easier. Now they've decided that the squids are pretty, pretty well schooled up here and that makes a good target so they've begun to fish during the day. Well our, our, our data would suggest that this is really not a great idea because this is when all the sexual selection is taking place, this is when all the egg laying is taking place, this is exactly when you shouldn't <laughs> be fishing and disrupting this process if you want a fishery next year. Sains come down about 60 feet. So this is about 140 feet or so. The sains could come down to about this depth. So this, so this th well, this is just one image. We've got hundreds of these. The, the squids are very often up in here. So the, the squids can be anywhere in the water column. It's just that we don't find big groups on the bottom. It's just one. You know, this is a representative image, thank you. Okay, uh, we mentioned earlier about the fertilization. We did uh, use DNA fingerprinting, which we helped develop with uh, Huey Sea Grant money. And we, we took an individual egg finger with 150 uh, little embryos in it, and we did the fingerprinting on those to distinguish how many daddies there could possibly be. Now, you can, you can do that without the exact daddy by the, the technique the molecular technique of fingerprinting. And what we found, here's three representative egg fingers. What we find is that out of the 150 or so, or whatever were in here, 130, 140, no, it was 150, uh, you've, got all, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six male fathers uh, were found among those 150 eggs. <laughs> so every egg finger, that egg finger, had six males represented genetically. Uh, this one had one, two, three, four. It's interesting that here one male is doing a lot better than other males. That's to be expected. You would think that might be the one male who's doing the guarding, but we're not sure. Here was split pretty much even among three guys, and one guy got 3% of the fertilizations. The point is that we're getting four to six fathers per egg capsule. Well, this will make us rethink some of our ideas, because when we saw that incredible mate guarding where the male just holds on to the female, and other squids don't do it <laughs> quite like that. And only 5% of the invaders broke up the happy pair. We thought that there would be uh, not 
so much paternity in every egg. So this makes you think of what we call female choice. The females may be able to selectively access stored sperm from previous matings and make that more available to fertilize their eggs. So clearly, we have a lot of complex male behaviors to try to get a female mate. We have equally complex, if not more complex, behaviors of choice going on by the female. And a lot of times, it's after copulation. So this is called post-copulatory sperm competition to try and point out a little bit about what's happening. Complex. OK, now uh, I'm just going to finish up and talk about some of our recent work. And this effort really um, is to try and develop a method so we can get some real data on uh, these populations. And this applies to the East Coast squid as well. So the idea is we don't know how many animals are recruited into the population, but we can at least use the number of eggs that we can find on the bottom as a proxy for how successful mating was, and we know a certain percentage of those uh, will recruit into the year class. So if there's one thing that you can do with a squid that you can't do with other marine animals. It lays all its eggs on the bottom right there to see and to be counted, if you can figure out a method to count them. Now a lot of people, myself included and many others, have gone underwater diving and said, bah, piece of cake, big white things all over the sand. We'll just go down and snap some pictures and do it on video. Well, that's a nightmare. It's a terrible job to try and quantify eggs on the bottom uh, in that manner. So what we did was we, we hooked up. We were able to get uh, some funding uh, on this project that Judy's already mentioned here, the collaborators. There are two guys in California. We tried to bring together the acoustic expertise along with the biological problem and see if we can actually find a fast, easy method to, uh, s to sort of image and quantify uh, these squid eggs. So uh, here's an example. Um, this is uh, myself and Ray Mikowski, the Department of Cal Def Department of Fish and Game. And I'm holding at the moment our tow fish right here, uh, which is a side scan sonar that we were towing off the bottom. And the question is whether or not these gelatinous egg fingers can actually be picked up by an acoustic signal, in this case side scan sonar, and distinguish that from the bottom. This is not trivial <laughs> to send a sonar image out to pick up a gelatinous, mostly water-filled egg tunic that's quite small on the bottom is not a trivial challenge. But Ken Foote certainly is up to the challenge. He is the expert in this area. Um, and you can see how high tech we are. I want especially uh, the kids to pay attention to this. Notice that we have a camera on this, and it's held together by duct tape, and it's completely jury-rigged, uh, and that's called a field expedient. Well, we couldn't do it any other way. We just duct taped it on there, and off we went. Uh, those things actually work. Uh, Ray had a very good idea of how to do that, so it wasn't completely helter-skelter. Now, another way to go down and look is this. We can use a towfish, or we can use the human fish. That's me, and this is Steve Claybush, uh, UC uh, Santa Cruz. And we did go down to try and do some of this diving, uh, but it was too deep. So I would say, yes, these are dashing outfits, but it's very inferior to an ROV. So the diving was way too dangerous, and we couldn't spend enough time doing things. So we, we got out of the diving business very quickly. It was way too dangerous and too deep. Uh, now, those what squids look like. Individual egg fingers have already described those. And here was the goal. See if we can develop a rapid remote synoptic survey to a method to try and quantify how many eggs are down there. So we specifically need to verify that what we're getting on the side scan sonar is squid eggs and not something else, like kelp fronds, or algae, or sea stars, or just sand, or whatever's down there. So that was really the challenge. And the approach was to go out and use high frequency side scan sonar and to use various cameras, either dropped um, just from the boat or driven on an ROV, and then to have good positional data on everything so we can make some associations between the acoustic records uh, and the actual eggs themselves. So here's the small vessel we used. Uh, this is Rick Kavitek, and there's me worrying about the problem. Uh, it's a very small vessel, but beautifully outfitted with all the acoustic and ROV gear uh, that we needed. So small vessel, very cramped quarters. Here's Pat Ian Petro looking at some of the acoustic gear. Here's me acting like I'm working. Here's Rick Kavitek actually working, driving the boat, and Ken's taking the picture. Cozy arrangement. 
uh, but it worked because all the gear was right there. Here's Pat right here. Uh, they see you've got some good lunches, good uh, spices for lunch. And uh, we we're able to get a lot of the positioning gear. It's quite nice because you've got an RV in the water. They know exactly where it is within a few meters uh, with the GIS system. And this is the small, it's literally this big, a small ROV with a camera on it. So we had a nice, tidy little package that these guys had. Monterey Bay is very large. Uh, this is Santa Cruz up here. Here's Monterey. All of our work in the fishery is taking place right here. And the bulk of the fishery is taken there. There are catches around here, but almost everything's taken right here. That happens to be where the eggs are. <laughs> so the fishery's clearly taken place near on the eggs. Here's Monterey. I've already seen this. And here's one of the tracks we're going to look at right here. It's the side scan sonar tracks right in that area. And so we look even a little bit closer. And you see we've got overlaid tracks. Um, in which we're trying to cover the area very carefully. And if we look at this in a little more detail, then we see all these little specks. Now, this is eight side scan sonar tracks all kind of glued together. But right in here, we had some very specific marks. And the question is, are those eggs or are they something else? That's really what we're trying to figure out. And later on, we took an ROV and we did a track down this way. Now, the ROV, we have a TV monitor and a boat so we can see what the ROV sees. So we can steer it into certain places. So we steered it in these particular ways. And when we saw eggs, we went over them. And in other places, we went where there weren't eggs. So we had a video record. And then we also had the acoustic record. Now we want to match them up and see what's what. And to test ourselves. Now I won't go into the testing, but we did a blind test so that we would take an acoustic record like that see the individual pixels on here. And I'd give that to Ken Foote, and I'd say, tell me, eggs or no eggs? He didn't know the video. He didn't know anything. And we did tests like that. And vice versa, he would take bits out of uh, the side scan sonar, and he would ask me, you know, what's in that spot? Or he would predict what's in that spot. So we could match these up. Here's a case where the video shows essentially no eggs, although one tiny little splotch about like this. And indeed, there are no real conspicuous spots here. The circle represents the area immediately under the boat. So no eggs, no conspicuous marks. Ken got that one right. Then I gave him this test where there were eggs up the wazoo. And there are lots of eggs there. I mean, that's just as thick as you can. That's like this room with nothing but eggs, OK? That's about what that area is. And we happen to be right here, but the ROV was looking in this direction. So the field of view there is about that. And lo and behold, you know, he looked at that and said, sure, of course. I think it's absolutely loaded with the thickest eggs we've ever seen. So he got a plus on that, and that worked. So we went through this, and we did this many times, uh, but it gave him increasingly harder tests, <laughs> which would be to take an area like this, where the eggs are maybe a meter in diameter, and they're spread out. And there's a starfish that could be confused, too. And we looked at there, and here the ROV was looking in this direction. So he made his estimates about what was there. And it was pretty startling that going by the darker splotches on the side scan sonar, there was this uh, quite uh, startling and highly significant correlation of those to the eggs in particular. Here's another case where there were a few eggs there, but there was nothing anywhere else here or here. Here's where the circle takes place. And the, the uh, ROV was aimed in this direction. It turns out that just right out in there, there were some of those eggs. So the technique turns out to be uh, really remarkably good, much to our surprise. Uh, and here's sort of a summary. If we tow this thing five to eight meters over the bottom at about two to three knots, each tow fish will take a, it'll take a swath 25 meters this way, 25 that way. So you're covering a lot of ground, so it's very efficient when it's working. Uh, and then you put those together. So you can do a survey in a fast time compared to video. We can resolve these egg mops as small as half a meter. So any egg mop bigger than about that, we were able to distinguish with the side scan sonar. That's OK. You know, for missing the blops this big, we're still getting 90% of the eggs out there. So I think that's OK. Uh, so we estimate with this method, at least in Monterey, where the spawning ground seemed to be small, we could probably do in two days, maybe four, a total grid survey to see what's there. And the post-processing is equally fast a matter of a few days. However, we haven't done either of these yet. We're going to be out in May to do the actual testing. Uh, these are very new results. Now, just a word about our newest directions. We've been very lucky to acquire uh, some 
uh, additional funding. And this is not to look at the squid eggs on the bottom, but how many squids are actually there laying those eggs. Now the squid is a little better, bigger target, and our, our idea is that when they all come in, we could see how many squids are actually laying eggs, and in a real-time management way, we could see a lot of those in one or two days, we could then tell the fishermen, okay, a lot of egg laying took place in the last two days, harvest them. Now that's getting to a much more realistic solution uh, that might be something like real-time management. Here's a, a, a scientific echo sounder, a very, a very nice one, uh, loaned to us by Simrad, industry partner in this. And this is an image that Ken acquired. Uh, this is right on the bottom where there's a very, very strong signal right here. Uh, these seem to be, these are probably eggs. But the question is, are those squids? Now we, we think they are. That jives with what we've seen previously on video. But we really need to validate and make sure that we can prove that those blips are squids. And in that way, we might be able to go out and really image the number of squids actively spawning on the bottom. This is a far harder task than doing the egg problem because these are moving animals and it's going to be harder to quantify those blips. Okay, so here's the final uh, dream that we have. Uh, we would like to see a management scheme based on the behavior of the spawning squids. Now the management plan they did is based on an egg escapement model, but the managers don't have data on the number of eggs laid, <laughs> so we could provide that. Uh, we would like to acoustically monitor the waves of spawners coming in and then tell them when they can harvest. I already just mentioned that. That would be a win-win situation. Maybe it's a little dreamy, but we've got to have a goal. We want to map the distribution and abundance of eggs over years and seasons so we can know what's normal and what isn't so that we have some standard to go by. The fishery currently doesn't have anything like that. If there are real hot spots of fish habitat, maybe they need to be protected at least periodically when a lot of squids are on fishing them. We don't want to close fishing grounds just for the heck of it, uh, but we do want to close them when the most spawning is occurring. Um, there may be more than one genetic stock. We don't know that, but we're really striving eventually, at least in Monterey because it's so tiny and such a, everything's right there, and it's a manageable number of boats. Real-time management could actually happen there, but it's going to take a huge amount of cooperation uh, by many people. So finally, uh, my last saying, those of you who go to the MVL library uh, might or might not have noticed this wonderful saying, which is my favorite, uh, put in there in the 1890s by Louis Agassiz, study nature, not books. Thank you very much. The question is whether or not these techniques and this approach could work here. Um, uh, it's different here because we don't have any known massive spawning aggregations uh, on the Cape, and I've spent almost six years trying to find them, and I can find a few. So the eggs are more dispersed. The, the squids here tend to spawn here and there and other places. Uh, that's a nice build-in safety factor. Uh, trawling is much more destructive to the eggs than purse seining is. So, and the trawlers, including ours at the MBL, definitely all pick up um, squid eggs when they trawl. Now, we and others, and the fishermen themselves, don't want bottom stuff, so net development has uh, increased a lot, thanks partly to Sea Grant funding, and so they pick up fewer and fewer of the eggs. But uh, when, <laughs> when a trawl comes through here in the shallow water, the eggs really do get disturbed, and certainly the squids do. Um, I think using our side scan sonar to try and find egg distribution here, it would be a next step. I think it'll be a little harder because we have more bottom material than Monterey Bay does. You noticed big open sandy areas. We picked a fairly easy study site, but we had two not so easy study sites in Southern California. We're still able to distinguish eggs. So I think it would be a challenge to implement it here, but it might work. Sir. Uh, it is established in our local species uh, by some work done in our lab at the MRC that the females are spawning 
uh, several days and weeks and even months later. So it's, it's serial intermittent spawning in the species here uh, from laboratory observations and indirect anatomy um, investigations uh, in the animals that are captured. In California, it seems to be the same way, only truncated a little more. I, we do, we're, we're sure that the females are spawning multiple times in California, but we don't know how many. And this is being found in lolligynid squids in at least five fisheries worldwide, that they are not spawning all at once. They are capable of spawning over weeks and days and months. Now you say that's not much, but if you only live six months and you're spawning over one to one and a half of those months, that's a pretty long spawning period on a percentage basis wide. So, yes. Yes. Oh, that's a loaded question there. <laughs> Colorblind camouflage. It's a subject of great interest to us. Uh, and the answer is I don't know. But uh, they do have not only pigmented chromatophores in the skin, but they also have structural reflecting iridescent cells in the skin. Now, some of the ambient light and color can be reflected by these broadband reflectors. So there is a way to get a little bit of color in your pattern just passively by what color might be immediately right next to you. But the truth is that uh, the fidelity of the color match is so spectacular. The idea that they don't have color vision, uh, I, can't, I can't tell you that that makes sense or it's easy to understand because we don't. It's a vexing question. I will tell you that recently we just did a very difficult experiment showing that they don't have color vision. That was good news. So we, did it, we decided to do this. If they don't have something in the eyes that allows them to see color, maybe they have something in the skin, an extraocular photoreceptor, sort of a light, some light sensitive organ in the elsewhere outside of the eye that may pick up information. So we did a quick and dirty uh, gene search. In other words, the uh, pigment in the eye is rhodopsin, so you can find out what the opsin gene is. And Stephen Roberts in our lab, uh, we gave him skin samples, and he just searched for the opsin genes. Now, why would you have an opsin gene anywhere else in your body if it's strictly for visual processing? Well, this only happened three weeks ago, and we, in the first test, have found some opsin genes out in part of the lateral and ventral skin. So maybe they have some other little gizmos that are tiny that are helping pick up the ambient light or maybe even color. I mean, I'm really stretching now, but we need to stretch. So, I mean, they can color match, and they don't have color vision, so who knows? Uh, yes? So the question is, that when, where, and how do they die if they're not mating and dying? Um, we know that they have built in to the genome of these animals uh, a program death. That's clearly what's happening. Uh, but I think what really happens is the animals sort of go downhill a little bit. And there's such immense predation pressure on them that I think the weakened animals get eaten by predators uh, very quickly once they get sort of spent or old. The interesting thing is the males die just as quickly as the females. And physiologically, the females are producing huge volume and quantities of eggs. You can see where they'd be worn out. But what about the males? I mean, sperm are cheap, we say in biology. They're not physiologically demanding. So you know, those, those, those guys are dying all at the same rate. So it really is a more built-in kind of program death. And I, uh, I don't think they're all going one place and flopping over dead. It's a process that's going on. They're fish chasing, and marine mammals and birds are chasing these things 24 hours a day. Man, it's a terrible life to be a squid out there, let me tell you. So, <laughs> sir. Yeah, great question. So how, does, uh, how do uh, migrations affect fisheries? On the west coast, uh, the squids um, are in Monterey Bay and very near shore in the spring and part of the summer. No one knows where they actually migrate off the California coastline. They do go off into somewhat deeper water, but it's all on the continental shelf, still in the one to 300 foot range. 
So the migrations are not understood very well in Monterey. They're sort of up real shallow and a little bit deeper, but it's all sort of sh somewhat short distances horizontally. Here, it's tr tremendously different uh, because we have a much colder winter, among other things. So here, the squids will show up next week like they always do. They'll be here for the summer. Uh, so uh, in the fall, they migrate offshore to the edge of the continental shelf in about uh, 900 to 1,000 feet of water where the Gulf Stream water is a stable temperature washing up from the south, and the squids stay right on the edge of the continental shelf. Uh, so they're, they're horizontally migrating, maybe 100 miles. In some cases, we have samples that have been as far as 600 kilometers from here that have come back to Cape Cod because we've been doing some DNA fingerprinting with some hui uh, money. So there was a big horizontal migration here, but we don't know the complexity of it. But uh, and what it means about the population here is much to our surprise when we did the DNA fingerprinting, we asked the question, the animals are inshore spawning here, is it all the same stock, same genetic stock of squid between here and New Jersey? And so we took samples all the way down. Well, we found five separate genetic stocks of the same squid <coughs> species between here and New Jersey. This was a huge surprise. <laughs> so now we have a lot of stock discrimination. Does it mean that the squids that spawn here and migrate offshore somehow find their way back here to spawn here again in, in the Cape Cod area and the same in Connecticut and the same in New Jersey? It could. We don't have the data to support that. But if you're a fishery manager, it makes you think real differently about how you regulate fishing in certain places because you can't fish hard in Cape Cod and assume that other squids will fill in that niche next year because <laughs> these, are, these animals are not interbreeding, obviously. They're separate genetic stocks. So we got a big surprise here. We don't quite know what it means, but fishery managers look at that and go, whoa, this is not the simple system we thought it was, just migrating in and out. Now we see real separate genetic differentiation. That means something, but we don't know what yet. Uh, did you have one question already? <laughs> Yeah, maybe one, but there's someone else. There are a lot of hands up. Yes? Are the larger squid the ones that spawn in the east? Are they also schooling? Uh, I don't understand why they wouldn't all be. Well, that's an individual, but they school too. Yeah. Yeah, all of these squids are schoolers. I mean, there's some deep sea squids that are solitary, but most of the shallow ones are schooling squids. So, when you know, when you see a school of five or ten of those swim up to you, you know you're in trouble. We had that. I don't ever want to do that again. Bill? No clue. I don't, uh, we don't know of any acoustic signaling in the animals. Doesn't mean they don't have it, but we don't know of any. No, I mean, uh, oh, you mean with ours? Right. Oh. Help, Ken. Is Ken here? <laughs> uh, I, the beak is so small that I don't, I think, I mean, we're getting a signal off the squid itself, but I don't think it's coming much off the beak because it's so tiny. But, but, but I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of acoustically retarded, so I'm not the person to ask. Sorry? There's no swim bladder in squid, so that uh, the swim bladders really give you a beautiful, ec and you don't get that, but still you can image a squid. Yes, in the back. For the recommendation of what? In Monterey, uh, they're divided roughly half and half. The, the fishermen are having the biggest arguments of all with one another. About half of them uh, support our research and are willing to follow the idea because they are a third, fourth, and fifth generation Italian fishermen and they want the fishery to stay small and they want it to continue. The other half of the fishermen are coming in from other parts of the West Coast and uh, they're just arguing that if they don't catch the squids, someone else will, or they're going to get eaten. So there's a lot of difference of opinion, uh, even amongst the squid fishermen. Uh, I think some of them uh, will go along with some of our data and hope that uh, we don't see a big plunge in the squid abundance in Monterey Bay. But actually, there was a dip in abundance in the last two years. And it coincided, we're not sure if it's completely connected, with unprecedented fishing pressure. So they got their first uh, hint 
that there might be a limit to how many percenters you can put on there in the peak of the spawning. But again, no one's been gathering these kinds of data, so it's very hard to give you a, a good scientific answer about whether the fishery is going up or down. And you find the fishermen of every ilk. Some agree and are progressive. Others got to pay the bills and are not as interested in the long term. Uh, almost all of the fishermen I and the others have encountered on this project are skeptical of scientists, uh, almost without fail. That's one of the reasons in California we go work with a fisherman on his boat as often as we can and let him understand that we're not crooks and trying to shut him down out of business, but to learn about the squid. It's a hard, it's a hard tightrope to walk. Ma'am. It was filmed uh, off Southern California at night with big bright lights. And you can still see this on television all the time. Howard Hall and uh, Bob Cranston, all these guys, Mike Degree, they all go out. And if you, the California squid has a fatal attraction to light. It's been the basis of the fishery for a long time. You put out bright lights, the squids come to it. We don't even know why. And when they do, you can catch them. Well, if you take your bright lights down to the bottom at night, you will attract squids. The squids will come by the hundreds and the thousands and the ten thousands. And when they're all down there, right next to each other, and there's the bottom, it's, hmm, well, they will pair up and they will begin to lay eggs under the bright lights. So it looks a lot as though the light is an artificial artifact stimulating reproduction under those conditions. Until someone can show us a naturally occurring spawning event at night, I will remain skeptical. Now, this is a flexible mating system, and I believe that it probably happens, but I don't think it's the norm. I don't think it's the most common. Sir? Good question. Do we have lights on the ROV that would have affected our scenes? We, uh, we drove our ROV at night with the lights off. Every 15 minutes, we would turn the light on and take uh, three seconds of videotape and turn it off again. So the answer was no. Braille. <laughs> we didn't move all that far. What we did is we stayed on an active spawning site and filmed right into dark, and then we stayed in the general area and just turned it on all night long every 15 minutes to get our samples. We just never saw squids, and so we need to do a lot more of that. But on our samples, we didn't find any. Yes? Did you get testimony on squids? Do they attack divers? Yes, they do attack divers, these big ones. Yeah, they're very aggressive. They attack everything. Garbage goes off a boat, they attack garbage. Uh, another squid gets caught on a hook and line, and they attack and cannibalize that squid. They are absolutely voracious, this Humboldt squid. And to me, it's one of the really true fierce predators in the ocean. They're big, they're mean, they eat everything in sight. Yes? Uh, not sure. We don't have too many records of these, but they seem to be uh, one to two years old. Still, <laughs> 150 pounds in two years. Yes? Not exactly while they're mating. What, what the, the, the day in the life of squid, Ivan Squidovich, is school during the day in a sort of defensive posture and, and mate and lay eggs occasionally. And at night, they disperse and feed. So they tend to feed at night and be in a defensive position during the day. That's do, they I, uh, do they sleep? We don't have any physiological evidence of sleeping. Swimming and sleeping would be quite a trick. Uh, but I think that's why they're burning the candle on both ends. That may be one explanation for a short life cycle. They just never turn the engine down. Yes, ma'am. But I'll stay if anyone wants. Okay, yes, ma'am. Yes. You said that the location of spawn, the scene that it's going to spawn near, is it strictly just the height of the dam? She wants to know if the giant squid spawns more than once. The giant squid lives uh, in about 5,000 feet of water, a little less, a little more. Uh, no biologist has ever seen a giant squid alive. Uh, specimens that are caught are moribund or dead, and so everything we know about a giant squid is sort of ex post facto. It's off a, sort of a dead animal. A lot of people have been trying to get lucky and go down and film these animals alive. They haven't had any luck yet. Whoever hits it will be all over the media, and uh, des deservedly so. Uh, 
there's so little known about the giant squid that I can't even speculate about that, except that we don't really know of any squid that really spawns once and dies. So one would have to, and we know something about maybe 200 species of other squids, so I don't know why the giant squid would be particularly different. I'd have to assume that uh, in its relatively short lifetime too, it is spawning several times. I mean, think about the game of evolution. The idea is to get your selfish genes in the remaining populations in future generations. If animals are going to play the probability game, and there's a lot of evidence to show that that's one of the things they do, then multiple matings over a longer period of time or a higher proportion of your short life cycle probably increases the chances of you winning that game. So I think to think that you'd only have mating once in a short time, there'd have to be some extraordinary benefit to that, to put all the eggs in one basket, as it were. So. You pick it. <laughs> yes, it was. Right, he did film uh, some massive die offs. Uh, I think there are the occasional and rare massive die-offs. And it may be that there are fewer happening today because last year when we published a paper on this in a scientific journal, uh, we got some heated emails <laughs> about our bogus data. And in Southern California, everyone said, you know, people have seen these mass die-offs. So there's a huge dive club called uh, Dive Bums in Southern California. They have thousands and thousands of divers. And we did a big diver survey through dive bums and got uh, thousands of divers to try and get any information on whether any diver had seen uh, a mating aggregation at night or even a mass um, death on the floor. And it turns out that the, the earliest one anyone could name was 1991. So some people started saying, well, maybe deaths occurred more and is occurring less now for some unknown reason. So I don't, I don't disbelieve that there are mass die-offs by Lola Gopalescens in California. I just think that it's a, it's a rare event. I don't know exactly why it happens, but if you look at the total mating strategy of these kinds of squids, they have a very flexible mating strategy. They can, they can mate here and lay eggs differently. Uh, they can mate at a very small size and store sperm. There's a lot of flexibility built into the system. So I don't, I'm not going to be surprised to see a lot of different things happening. The question is, what happens the most in the norm? And if you fish the animals at that time, are you going to really impact the population? I think that's the thing we've got to focus on. And, and we're trying to on the spawning grounds. We took one spawning ground, and we saw just the opposite of everything that's sort of in the books and in the management plans. <laughs> so we've published our data. It, hopefully, it will just stimulate people to think a little more broadly about how the animals are actually living. And thus, the theme of my talk, the behavioral ecology of the animal is very important in managing a living resource. It's not a static dead resource. You really have to know something about where it goes and why it goes there and when. Okay, well, thank thanks very much.